Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the episodes relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. This one, Measuring the Universe, relates especially to God's first book of nature. Measuring the distance to the farthest away galaxies requires taking several steps up a ladder, called the Cosmological Distance Ladder. I will explain each step and the outcome. This episode is necessarily a little longer and more complex than most of the others. One Friday night, many years ago, I had a special experience with a group of high school students up north at Beacon Bible Camp. It was the middle of winter and the camp road wasn't yet cleared of snow, so we had to walk in. As we carefully stepped through the snow, the sky was so clear and dark that the stars overhead captured our attention. Suddenly we noticed a faint smudge near some bright stars, which turned out to be the Andromeda Galaxy. It was mind-blowing to see an object that was two and a half million light years away, even though we couldn't see its beautiful spiral shape without a telescope. Perhaps you've wondered how astronomers are able to measure distances to objects in the universe so far away, such as the Andromeda Galaxy. Well, there are five steps in what's called this cosmological distance ladder, and I'll explain them to you. The first step is to measure the distance from the Earth to the Sun. This is known as one astronomical unit, and it's approximately 150 million kilometers. The method used to measure this distance involved observing the transit of Venus across the face of the Sun from two different points on Earth. I observed the transits of Venus in 2004 and 2012. I projected the Sun's disk through my telescope onto a white piece of paper and I watched the tiny round shadow of Venus slowly cross the Sun's surface over a couple of hours. So here's a picture where you can see my hands holding the paper on an easel and there's the Sun's disk and there's the tiny round black shadow of Venus in the top right corner. In 1663, James Gregory, a Scottish mathematician and minister, figured out that if the transits of Venus are observed from two different locations far apart, you can actually calculate the distance to the Sun. Gregory himself was not able to do this, as the next transits of Venus didn't occur until after his death. But when that time came, the Earth-Sun distance was determined to be 152 million kilometers, which is within 3% of our modern value found through radar. This is the first step in the cosmological distance ladder. Once astronomers had the Earth-Sun distance, the next thing they did is use triangulation, something surveyors use all the time, to find the distance to the nearest stars. This is step two up this cosmological distance ladder. It involves the use of parallax, something you've experienced. Think back to a time when you were traveling along a highway in the country. As you looked over the fields, you noticed that a faraway barn appeared to be lined up with a distant house. Ten seconds later, when your car was 100 meters further along the highway, the barn had moved a little away from the house. But the barn and house hadn't really moved at all. It was you that had moved. This is what parallax is. The apparent movement of something far away when in fact it is we who are moving. Astronomers use parallax to measure the distance to nearby stars. As the Earth orbits the Sun, the position of a nearby star will appear to shift slightly due to parallax. As the Earth goes from one side of the Sun to the other side of the Sun moving through space. By measuring the angle of this shift and using trigonometry, astronomers can calculate the distance to the star. This next diagram illustrates how the line of sight from the Earth to a nearby star against the background of the distance fixed stars changes from June to December, as the Earth, where we are observing from, moves to the opposite side of the Sun. Let me explain this here a little. So on the left, you have the Earth going around the Sun. At the top, the Earth's position in June. At the bottom, the Earth's position in December. So in June, that straight line towards the nearby star and then projected onto the background stars is different from what you see in December. That's the line going up. You see different background stars. The two rectangular boxes above and below the nearby star show what you see. The nearby star has shifted its position, but it hasn't really. It's us who have moved 
but we can calculate through parallax how far away it is then. In reality, the nearest stars are so far away and the parallax angle so tiny that astronomers weren't able to observe this until large telescopes had been built. Frederick Bessel first measured the parallax of stars in 1838 and thus determined their distance. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, was found to be 8.6 light years away. If we compare this to the distance of the Sun, which is only 8 light minutes away, we see that the nearest stars are hundreds of thousands of times more distant. One year has more than half a million minutes in it. So no wonder the nearby stars appear just as tiny pinpricks of light against the dark sky at night. This parallax method of measuring stellar distances only works for stars out to a distance of 300 light years maximum. But for them it is very secure. We now know the distances to over 400 nearby stars to an accuracy of better than 1% and the distance to 7,000 nearby stars to an accuracy of better than 5%. Now we're ready for step 3. How far away are the faint stars? For this we need to know the inverse square law of light. As light travels across space, it gets dimmer by the inverse square of the distance. Let me give an example. Years ago I taught school in Columbia, South America. On holidays, when I was up in the nearby mountains, I loved going out at night to look across the wide valley at the dark hillsides dotted with faint lights. Each light represented a home and I often reflected on the people who lived in those simple houses and how hard they worked on their hillside farms. One night I put on my physics teacher hat and thought about how to determine the actual distance to those faraway farms. I knew that the farmhouses all used 40 watt light bulbs connected to nearby electric wires running over the mountains and I had often taught my students that as light spreads out across space it gets fainter according to the inverse square of the distance. In other words, a 40 watt light bulb that is 10 times farther away than one nearby will be 100 times fainter. So with a light meter attached to a telescope, I could focus on a distant 40 watt light bulb and determine its distance from its luminosity in the inverse square law. This way of determining distances to faraway lights such as stars is called the standard candle method. When the law was discovered, people didn't have electric light bulbs to light their homes but candles, often made at the same factory. The key point is that the lights or the candles or the stars that you're referring to all have to be standard, having the same intrinsic brightness. After Bessel introduced step 2 with his new telescope, measuring nearby stars by parallax, some astronomers noticed that stars with similar spectra have the same luminosity, like the 40 watt light bulbs. They then realized that these stars could be used as standard candles to measure distances to farther away stars. That meant that if a certain star was 100 times fainter than another very similar star with the same spectra for example, it must be 10 times farther away. 10 squared is 100, inverse square law. Here's an example of this. A faint star with spectra almost identical to that of the brightest star Sirius but with a luminosity a million times fainter must be a thousand times farther away. A thousand squared is a million. Now since Sirius is 8.6 light years away, that star would be 8,600 light years away. But what about stars much further away like those in other galaxies? So we've gone from the distance to the Sun, 8 light minutes away, step 1, to distances to nearby stars such as Sirius, 8 light years away, step 2, to distances to stars across a good part of our galaxy, 8,000 light years away, step 3. Of course the creation of these steps over history took several hundred years. But we're now ready for step 4 and this is based on the brilliant work of the American astronomer Henrietta Leavitt. She focused on a special group of stars called Cepheid variables and she chose to study the ones that were all located in the same group of stars called the Small Magellanic Cloud. The luminosity of these stars varies with a precise rhythm going from brighter to dimmer to brighter, etc. Leavitt measured their period of variation and their apparent luminosity or magnitude. Now since they were all the same distance away, located in the same group of stars, 
Levitt could find out how their absolute magnitude depended on their period of variation. When she plotted a graph, here's what she discovered. There, you can see that on the left margin, the left axis, absolute magnitude. Going from minus 2 to minus 6, by the way, um, brighter stars have a more negative magnitude. So the brightest stars are the minus 6 ones here. And on the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, you have the period going from 1 day to 10 days in the middle to 100. It's a logarithmic scale. So the stars that take the longest time to vary near 100 days, or at least you could say 80 days, are the brightest stars. That's what she found. And they're all located the same distance away, so that was really useful for her. CFIT variables are very bright stars, which, which can be seen in other nearby galaxies like Andromeda, just as they can be seen in her own galaxy, Milky Way. So Levitt had discovered a new standard candle that can be used to find distances across our Milky Way galaxy and out to other galaxies. Here's how. We measure the period of a CFIT variable in Andromeda galaxy, for example. We then find its absolute luminosity using the period luminosity graph that we just saw. When we compare this with its apparent luminosity that we actually see through a telescope, we can use the inverse square law of light to find the distance of the CFID variable in the Andromeda galaxy. That's how we know that Andromeda is more than 2.5 million light years away. We're now ready for step 5, finding out how far away are the most distant galaxies. Here's another story, true story. In February 1987, there was great excitement at my old university, the University of Toronto. A graduate student, Ian Sheldon, had just discovered the first nearby supernova in four centuries while he was working at an observatory in Chile. Supernovae are large stars that have burned their nuclear engines for a long time until they finally exhaust all their fuel. When this happens, they suddenly implode and then explode with a massive burst of light. Over a few hours, they become millions of times brighter, shine for several weeks, and then fade away. Chinese astronomers had observed a nearby supernova back in 1054 AD. Then the European astronomer Johannes Kepler saw one in 1604, more than half a millennia later. But from then until 1987, no close supernova had been observed. So you can imagine how excited people were when this new supernova, just barely outside our galaxy, was observed by Ian Sheldon and other astronomers in 1987. By the way, in the meantime, astronomers did see supernova far away in other galaxies, but not nearby. Now, a certain kind of supernova, which is called type 1a, have characteristics that make them useful as standard candles. Since they are extremely bright for a short time, they can be detected in galaxies at the far edge of the universe. And since their absolute luminosity curves are well known, their apparent luminosities give us their distance using the inverse square law of light. With this method, we have located galaxies up to 10 billion light years away. Now let's conclude this essay. Using well-established scientific methods, we have climbed up the cosmological distance ladder, step by step. We started with finding the distance across our solar system to the sun using the transits of Venus, step one. We then built on step one to find the distances to nearby stars using parallax, step two. Using standard candles, very similar stars, we found distances to far away stars, step three. Then, using CFID variable stars, we found distances to nearby galaxies like Andromeda, step four. Finally, using supernova of a common type as standard galactic candles, we found distances to far away galaxies, step five. We're now at the top rung of the cosmic distance ladder. We can see galaxies that are over 10 billion light years away. In a future episode, I will discuss a further part of the distance ladder, the galactic redshift relationship, and explain how scientists are now able to estimate the age of the universe to be 13.7 billion years, and the full width of the universe to be 92 billion light years. What does this vastness of the universe, which also implies that it has a great age, mean for Christians? For me, it just confirms what the Bible says about God's greatness. Psalm 19, which I've quoted in other episodes, says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 33 uses a very imaginative description of how the stars were breathed out by God. It says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. 
their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 33. These words are just as true today in describing God's greatness as they were when the psalm was first written. When we study the universe, we can say, as many famous astronomers have said, unto God be all the glory. Amen. Thank you for listening. To further study these five steps, please read carefully my printed essay on my website and consult the references there. Thank you.